Hey, everybody, and welcome to another Sunday with Pinnacle Church in our online experience. If you don't know me, my name is Heath. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are just really excited that you've taken the time out of a very busy day to connect with us, engage with us on this online platform. Listen, if you are new here, we would love to hear from you. You can text new to the number that's gonna pop up on your screen there. And I promise we won't harass you, call you or anything. We just wanna have a record of your visit and we'd just like to send you some information. So if you're new, do that. Hey, we've been in this series recharge for a couple of weeks now. We're learning about habits and things that help us to recharge mentally and spiritually. And today we're gonna talk about something that Christians have been doing ever since Jesus walked the earth that helps us to recharge spiritually and mentally. And you're probably going, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is the Christian practice of communion, or depending on your tradition, you might call it the Lord's Supper. Now, here's the thing. I know uh, some of you checking us out, tuning in with us, you're not yet Christian, you're still trying to explore the faith, and you're probably sitting here going, hey man, I really need something to get me uh, from point A to point B, from Monday to Friday, and I'm going to tune out now because you're talking about this super theological thing called communion, and I don't know what that has to do with me. Listen, I want to encourage you right now, don't tune out. Hang in there with me because here's the thing. Communion is a physical symbol of a much deeper spiritual truth that I believe if you'll hang in there and with me during this, you may find has the power to change your life. Also, you may be wondering, hey, I have been exploring Christianity and why do they do this thing where they take bread, they take wine, they take bread, they take grape juice, and they do this weird thing where they say it's like Jesus' body and stuff. And uh, you may wanna know what the symbolism is. Now, I know a bunch of you watching know you're Christians. And it's been a while since we've had communion since COVID hit as a church. And we're going to do that later uh, in our experience today. We're going to have communion there. So I hope you have prepared some elements there. If not, run, get them, watch me while you're walking, get a cracker, get some juice, get some water, whatever you need so that we can have communion together. And the, here's the thing, I think as Christians, it's really important that we partake in this, but also as I talk about it today, you may find and understand at a deeper level why this is so important to recharge you, to recharge you in your spirit and to recharge you in your mind. And even, I think, to just recharge you physically because sometimes what goes on in the mind affects our body. So to do that, to kind of look at this today, we're gonna go to the book of the Bible called 1 Corinthians. We're gonna be in chapter 11. And we're going to look at some words where the Apostle Paul had to give some instruction to the Corinthian church. And to kind of set the stage for you, the Corinthian church had some issues. And one of those was they were really messing up when it came time to have communion. In the church of that time, this is uh, about 30, 40 years, so don't, don't quote me on that, but after Jesus has died, uh, a church has been established in Corinth in uh, what would be Greece today, and they were literally, Paul talks about it, getting drunk at communion. Uh, they, were, they weren't just taking a little sip of the wine, they were getting crunked up. Well, they're supposed to be participating in this thing uh, that symbolizes Jesus. And so Paul had to write some instructions, and what was going on was they would have a fellowship meal and the more wealthy people would get there early. They would be in the best seats because the churches were house churches then, in the house. And the poor people, because there were no days off from work, would come later to the gathering. They would be forced to be out in the courtyard. The wealthy people would bring food. The poor people would have nothing to eat. The wealthy people would be eating, some getting drunk. And the poor people would have nothing to eat. And then they would partake in communion together. And we're going to see in a little bit why that was not cool. Can you imagine if you showed up at church today and people were getting crunked up? Maybe we'd grow. I don't know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, but here's the thing. In that context, Paul is wanting to show them the importance of this thing that we call the Lord's Supper or we call communion. And we're going we're gonna to walk into the middle of that conversation. So look what Paul says here. First Corinthians chapter 11. Starting with verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, Paul here is relating uh, an instance where Jesus, the night before he would be betrayed and go to the cross, die, where he was with his disciples. They were participating in the Jewish custom of Passover. Passover symbolized in the Old Testament when the children of Israel were freed from their slavery. The death angel came through Egypt, passed over the house of Israel, passed over the Jewish children, and uh, God brought judgment upon Egypt. And they celebrate that to remember that God passed them over in his judgment and he set them free. It was in that context that Jesus at that meal would take bread and institute a new Passover for those who believe in him. He would say, this bread is symbolizing my body. This cup, this wine, this juice symbolizes my blood that I'm preparing to shed for you on the cross. And so here's something I want you to understand about communion, all right? During communion, when you participate in it, we look backwards, forwards, and we look inwardly to experience Christ. And so Jesus here says, anytime you take a a wafer like this or bread and, and you participate with other Christians in communion, it is a moment for you to look backwards and remember what Jesus has done on your behalf. And, and, and I think sometimes we can get in the routine and the duty of it, whether you are in tradition that has communion every time you go to church or you're in traditions that do it less frequently or some traditions only do it once a year. And there's different views. Of, does the bread, like Catholics believe the bread literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus. I, I do not subscribe to that for my Catholic friends. I believe there's something spiritual going on there. Uh, it is a memorial. It is a remembrance. But there's something spiritual that happens in communion. But here's the thing. What is important is that we we don't get to the point that we just come to it and just do it out of a sense of duty or here we go again as some religious tradition. It's so much more meaningful than that because it literally is a physical symbol and a reminder of the fact that Jesus' body was broken for you and it was broken for me. When we take that cup, it is a physical and symbolic reminder of the truth that he did bleed his life out and shed his blood for your sins and my sins. He went to the cross to die for me and you and do something we could never accomplish on our own. He gave his life to take a punishment for our sin. He didn't deserve it. He was God's son. He was God in the flesh. But he took your place and he took my place. And so when we, when we take communion, We are looking back and remembering his sacrifice, but we're also remembering what that sacrifice has done for us. Because not only does he take our punishment, but then he sets us free and he gives us a new life. And in that new life, we become the children of God. We get a new father in heaven. We get a new family. And so every time you come to the table of the Lord and you partake in communion, you're not just remembering Jesus' death and his sacrifice, you're also reflecting and remembering and thinking on what he has done and accomplished in you and through you and the new life that you've been given. Jesus said, I've come to give them life and to give it abundantly. And so we look back and remember that. And here's the thing. I think that communion is the cure for spiritual amnesia when it comes to Christians. Now, uh, you're like, why why do you say that? Well, think about it. Amnesia is when uh, you forget something. You can have a severe case of amnesia where you forget half your life or you forget your identity. I remember back in the early 2000s, there was a really funny movie that came out with Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore. It was called 50 First Dates. If you've not seen it, go watch it. It's hilarious. But in that movie, Adam Sandler's character, uh, they're in Hawaii. He's this uh, marine biologist, and he he goes to a cafe, and he sees this girl, and she's beautiful, and uh, he's into her, and her name's Drew Barrymore. He has a great conversation. He comes back the next day, and she's forgot all about him. What you find out in the movie is she had been in an accident, and every single day she has amnesia, and she cannot remember. She is stuck in her mind on one certain day of her life, her birthday. 
Or no, it's her dad's birthday. But here's the point. She can't move past that. She's always forgetting. And so in the movie, it's just his attempts to woo this woman who can't remember him from day to day. And finally, finally at the end of the movie, you see there's a beautiful scene, spoiler alert, sorry, where he has made a video for her that every morning when she wakes up, he's there on the video telling her what's happened in her life, reminding her of milestones in her life. And as their relationship progresses, they get married, they have a kid. You see their wedding video, you see those things. And it's there to help remind her in her forgetfulness of what her life really is. When you come and you take that bread and you dip it or sip that wine or sip that juice, you are being reminded of the life that you have in Jesus, because we forget it. Sometimes, especially this season we've been in, we forget who we are in Jesus. We forget all the benefit that we have in Jesus. We, we forget all the good that he's done in our life because we look at all this stuff going on in the world. We're getting ready to, we're in it now. We're not getting ready to. We're in this political season where people are, you know, no matter what your party is, be nice. But people are, are mad at each other and it's just crazy and, and we, we forget who we are in Christ. And sometimes as we, we get into the storms of our life, we can forget all the good that God has done on our behalf and for us and all the love that he showered us with. But it's in that simple act of taking a wafer, putting it in your mouth, and in that moment thinking about Christ and what he has done and given you that you can have a recharge, a reset, and be reminded of who you are in him. That is why it's so significant and so important. But Paul goes on. He doesn't just say that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. But look at something else that he says. It's also a time to look forward. And why do I say that? Well, if you look in verse 26, he says this. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And, and what, what Paul is saying there is that Christians have done this for 2,000 or so years now, that every time that we partake in the Lord's Supper, in communion, we are in a symbolic, visible, physical way proclaiming the gospel, the truth that Jesus died to save sinners from their sin. And we're also looking forward to the time when he will eventually return to set all things right. It's called the great hope in the Christian tradition. It's the hope of the resurrection. Because you see, Jesus died on the cross and he gave his life. But remember, he said, we do this, we proclaim his death till he comes, till he comes back. And we are hopeful that one day there will be this resurrection. And the world, you know, a lot of people think heaven is we're gonna go up to heaven, we're gonna sit on some clouds, we're going to play uh, worship music all day, and we're going to float around and be like angels. But that's not heaven. Heaven will be a remade earth. Right will be, wrong will be righted. Justice will roll down like rivers, we're told in Scripture. And we will live in the new age and the new kingdom. And that's something to hope for. And so not only are we looking backward when we participate in communion, but we're looking forward to the hope that we have, that though we may have trouble and tribulation in this life, we may go through seasons of pandemic, we may go through seasons of social unrest, we may go through tough times, we may go through sickness, we may go through relational struggles, one day Jesus will make it all right. I know sometimes somebody might hear that, push back and say, what's the problem, you Christians, you got this pie in the sky attitude. Uh, you believe in a sky daddy that's going to make everything right, and I don't believe that. But here's the thing. If I believe that Jesus Christ lived and walked on this earth, that he did indeed die for my sins, rise again on the third day, he was who he said he is, then I'm going to take his word at it that he said he's coming to make everything right. I believe that, and I hope in that. And it's not just a hope like when I was in middle school and I'd be like, oh, I hope this girl likes me. It's a hope in something that I know will come to pass. You, you ever had a time in your life when you knew you were, maybe it was a birthday or maybe it was when you were getting ready to get married or maybe if you're a parent here, it was when your child was about to be born or, or maybe uh, you're, you're single here and it was that, 
that first date with that guy you really like or that girl you really like or a trip or, or maybe when you were about to, you put so much work and effort into college and you're about to graduate and you, you have that moment when there's something you're really looking forward to and you're hopefully expecting what's gonna happen. That's how we have to look at the return of Jesus. It's not just some theological thing out there. that it, It's a center of what we are. Another way to look at this is, uh, I've shared this a lot. I, I'm a kayaker, and, and I'm so excited because in about a week, I'm getting something that I have wanted for a really long time. I'm getting a custom dry suit. You're like, what in the world is a dry suit? It's this Gore-Tex suit you wear that keeps you completely dry and really, really cold water. Lots of my friends have them. It's a requirement to paddle in the winter. You're probably like, you're crazy. Nah, I like, I like it. But here's the thing. If you look at my build, okay, I, I'm like, I'm, I, I joke. I say I'm a dwarf from Lord of the Rings. I'm short and I'm wide. And when you go to buy stuff off the rack, like when you go to buy a dry suit from these uh, people who make them off the rack and you get what fixed me up top, the problem is, they make it for up here, but down below, I'm short. It would fit Shaquille O'Neal. I've got all this extra leg, and it's just unwieldy and dumpy. So I can't, I can't just go buy one off the rack. And so I've just kind of had to deal with that. But finally, I'm getting this custom one. My family got together, my birthday, mom, dad, they gave money and stuff, and uh, Shauna and, and my daughter, they, and I'm getting one that's custom fit for me. It's going to fit me right up here. It's going to be the right length for my vertically challenged body. And it's going to fit me perfectly. I'm expecting that and looking forward to when I get that. But here's the thing. I think about that moment when the Lord returns and he makes everything right. And it's in that moment when you will finally fully be what you were meant to be. Life will fit then in his kingdom and when you, can, when you are taking communion, you're looking forward to that day when you'll finally fully realize all that you're intended to be and what real life, eternal life, is meant to look like. Now, so with communion, we look backwards, we look forwards, but we also look in here. Why do I say that? Well, Paul goes on, and, and Paul gives some kind of stern words here. He says, uh, he says in verse 27, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. We look backward to what Jesus has done. We look forward to what he's going to do. And we look inwardly to ourselves to see where we're at. And to examine ourselves. You see, Paul was dealing with a situation here where these people were coming to God's table. They were not taking it serious. They were not treating fellow Christians the way they should. They were excluding them. And Paul is like, you need to take this in a manner that's worthy. Now, I want you to understand something here. You may be sitting there today and you're a Christian. I'm talking to Christians here. And you're like, I've got some things in my life that I need to deal with. I've got some sins that are holding me down. Those things should not keep you from the Lord's table. They should propel you to his table. When you come to communion, it is a time to look inside and say, God, reveal to me my blind spots and reveal to me those things that I'm not even aware of that are getting in the way that are preventing me from walking fully in the relationship that I have with you. You examine yourself. You take time to confess. You take time to look and say, hey, is there unforgiveness in my heart? Is there bitterness in my heart? You take time to look, knowing the context here, and say, how am I treating the people around me in my life? Am I loving my neighbor? Am I loving God the way I should? And you take that moment to examine your life in light of Christ. And he will reveal to you what you need to repent of, what needs to change, those blind spots that we all have. And it's in that moment that you don't shirk away from the table. You come to the table and take the bread and you take the body because you know that you've been saved by God's grace. And so it's a time of examination. 
And that's why, you know, you got to understand something. When we look at this, communion, you say, who can take communion? Believers. That's the one requirement, that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you got to remember, what does all this symbolize? It symbolizes what Jesus has done on the behalf of those who have put their faith in him. And so today, you're watching this, and you're thinking, can I partake in communion? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Have you put your faith in him? Then yes, of course you can. You may say, well, I've, I've, I fell back. I've got some things going on. Then throw yourself on God's mercy. Come to him. Repent. Ask him to show you what needs to change. Come to his table and find healing there as you spiritually experience Christ. And so see, we've, we've seen today, okay, that, w- that we come to this thing. This is a moment, a very special moment that Christians for thousands of years in different cultures, in different ways, in different expressions have experienced Jesus. And they've come together as a church. And they've felt recharging and renewal for their souls and their minds as they do this simple act of taking a piece of bread and eating it and remembering what Jesus has done. As they take the fruit of the vine and they take a sip and then remember that he loved them enough to believe for them. And so you're hearing this and, and maybe as you're sitting here, you're like, I hear these truths, but, but I'm not sure where I'm at with Christ. Well, let me ask you a question if I could. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Some of you, you've, you've been connecting for six months now with us online. You've been through all these sermon series. You've been learning so much. But ask yourself this honest question. Have you put your trust in Christ? Listen, I know you may push back right now and say, well, I don't understand everything about the Bible or even everything about this thing you call the Christian faith. That doesn't matter. What matters is what have you done with Jesus? He loves you. He desires relationship with you. He has made a way for your life to change. He came to set you free from your sin. And what is sin? Sin is missing the mark. And we all sin. We all know that intrinsically. And so have you, this this Jesus that I'm talking about, that the Jesus that communion points to, the truth under the symbolism, that he came to die for you, live for you, and give you a new life, have you accepted that? If you've not yet, I want to encourage you to do that. If you're on our online platform, go. Talk to one of our people. Maybe you're not ready to talk to someone, but right now, perhaps you'd, you're like, Heath, I want that. I want that right now. Well, I'm going to pray in just a minute, and you can pray with me as a symbol of what I think is going on in your mind and your heart right now. And then what we're going to do is we're going to partake in communion. So let's pray. Father, in this moment as we prepare to take this bread and take this juice, I pray, God, that we would take the moment to look backward, to reflect on what Jesus has done. And may it stir gratitude in our hearts. May it also stir love in our hearts. And then as we look forward to when he returns, may we be the most hopeful of all people. In this moment, Lord, may we look inside ourselves to see what things need to change and what we need to give to you. It could be the bitterness of our heart and forgiveness. Any of those sins, Lord, that we've not laid down before you. A mistrust, Lord, idols in our life. Just show those things to us right now. Bless these elements, God. And may we meet with you in our homes and wherever we're watching this right now. And for those of us, Lord, that have listened and stuck through this, that do not know you as Lord and Savior, may this be a clear moment when you open our eyes and our minds to understand our great need for you. Now listen, if that's you, before I do this, I want to give you an opportunity to put your faith in Christ. If you're ready to make that commitment, you're like, I'm ready to give my trust and my faith to Jesus. As a symbol, as an outward expression of what's going on inside you, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I want to trust you. I confess my sin to you. And I'm going to believe in you. 
from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I would love to hear from you. Send us a message. I want to get you some resources and talk to you about next steps. Now, let's partake in communion. Jesus did the night before he was with Chad, He took bread and he would break it. And he would say, this is my body broken for me. This is his body. Take it. Later, he would take a cup and he would look at them and he would say, in this cup is my blood shed for your sins. This is his blood shed for you. Let's take it. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us, dying for us, and living for us, and now living through us. May we experience you in this moment.